Revelation chapter number 14 is where we're going to be. We're going to try to finish this chapter tonight. If you were with us last week, we got started in Revelation 14 and made it about basically about halfway through or just a little past halfway. And we're going to pick back up there tonight and just see what the Lord has for us and finish up chapter 14. It may get into chapter 15. We'll just kind of wait and see how things go. Um, but a lot to talk about, a lot to look at here of things that are happening. And uh, we're, we're making our way through the book. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, we started this study early in the year, I guess probably in January, February we started. And we've just been taking our time through it. And I've learned a lot. And I'm yes. thankful for what I've learned and what the Lord showed me. And I hope that it's helped you as well. But Revelation chapter number 14, who thinks it's soon for the Lord to return? Yes. Amen. I do too. I think he's soon to come. I believe that. And, and I saw, I talked a little bit about it this morning. Um, even more evidence of it this past week with what took place at the White House. Uh, the signing of the peace agreement and things like that over in the Middle East. All of that stuff is just happening right before our very eyes. And the world is just seeing it, you know, as, as a peace agreement. But I see it as prophetic events yeah. happening uh, yeah. in our lifetime. And it's pretty amazing. And even Donald Trump said himself, there will be other countries to follow. And he's expecting anywhere from five to six other countries to fall into this agreement. And they call it the Abrams Accord or Abraham's Accord. And I thought, wow, what a name for that yes. and stuff. And I'm thankful for what Genesis 12, 3 tells us and stuff. And I'm thankful that we still are a friend of the nation of Israel. Yes. And I hope and pray that continues. Because the moment that stops, then our days are numbered. Yes. And I believe that with all my heart. And I'm thankful that right now we do have a president in office that supports Israel. That is so important. Yes. Uh, as, as you know, as we go through these chapters in Revelation, we also try to talk about contemporary issues and things like that going on in the world today. And we do that because it's prophetic, uh, prophetic events. It's things that uh, we can see what Revelation tells us and then we can actually see it on Fox News when we turn the news on. We see this stuff happening right before our very eyes. But just this past week with Abram's Accord, uh, with the peace agreement there with, with Israel and UAE and, and, uh, and the others there, it uh, was amazing to see uh, one night, I don't remember what night that it was, but uh, I saw a video, it was a live feed in Jerusalem of the old Jerusalem walls, and they actually had all the flags that were in that agreement flying projected up on that wall. And I thought, wow, that's, that's amazing. And it, it gives you chills to think how close we are coming uh, to the coming of the Lord. And it could happen at any moment. A lot of people think that there's a lot of things that need to happen uh, before he comes. That's not true. Don't, don't feed into that. He could come back at any moment. Uh, we're not waiting on a peace agreement. We're not waiting on a temple to be built. We're not waiting on anything that has to happen before he returns. Everything that, uh, that, that's taken place has taken place for a reason at a certain time, at a pointed time, and he could step out on the cloud and come at any moment. And that's why it's so important for us to be ready, to know that we're ready, and to live every day as if it were our last. Yes. You know, I said when we first started this study, if we really believe the Lord could come back at any moment, then that should change the way we live our lives. Mm -hmm. We should be found you know, living our life like the Lord could come back at any moment. You know, what will you be doing when the Lord comes back? Where will you be when the Lord comes back? What you, will you be saying when the Lord comes back? What will you be thinking when the Lord comes back, you know, something to really ponder on and think about because I believe it is soon to happen. I really do. I'm not a date setter. The Bible uh, says not to do that. Only God himself knows when he's coming back. But uh, I do believe that I'll see it in my generation. I believe this, yes. my generation will see the coming of the Lord, which Paul preached it the same way. Paul believed it was going to happen in his lifetime. You know, we're 2,000 years closer than Paul so yes. we're a lot closer to it than he was, but he preached as if it was going to happen at any moment yes. and stuff. So, so thankful for the study that we have, and, and I encourage you, pay attention to what's happening in the news, um, because it, it is so relevant, prophetically speaking, right now. I know we're in, a, in an election year, um, everything going on with that. I said this morning that the election just got that much more important with the whole thing with the Supreme Court. And what's going on there. 
uh, and then also you've got this this uh, peace agreement with Israel and things like that, and, and other countries are soon to follow. One of the big players that they're expecting to join soon will be Saudi Arabia. And if that happens, you're talking about something that would just be amazing. Uh, that has never happened before. And uh, so that's a big player there. I mean, there's a lot going on. And then, of course, we're in the, the Jewish New Year uh, now. That started uh, just the other night. And everything, so a lot going on prophetically. Pay attention to Israel, pay attention to the news and what's happening because it is so relevant to what we're studying and talking about in here on Sunday nights. Um, I told you, for me personally, I downloaded an app on my phone, I forget the name of it, but basically it's, it's breaking news in Israel. And I downloaded that app, so every time something happens, I get an alert, here's what's going on in Israel. And it's amazing. All the stuff that is happening in Israel on a daily basis. I usually get anywhere from five to seven things a day coming out of Israel. Very interesting articles, very uh, reputable uh, people writing those articles and things like that. You do have to be careful what you read and who you listen to and stuff like yes. that. But that's true with everything. Um, but, uh, but it's amazing of what's coming out of the Middle East right now. So it's very, very relevant to what we're studying and we'll talk more about that as we get farther on in the book of Revelation. But chapter number 14, you found your place there. We'll review just a moment just to kind of get you uh, back up to speed. I like doing that. If we don't finish a chapter, I like to review just a little bit just to keep you refreshed. And, and also, I know a lot of you take notes and things like that. But we got to chapter 14, verse number 1. It says, And I looked... We know that to be John. He's given a personal account of what's happening here. He said, And I looked, and lo, a lamb, with a uppercase L, lamb, stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, there's several things out of that one verse. First of all, we see lamb. We know the lamb is who? Jesus Christ. Yes, yeah, it's an uppercase L. It's the Lamb. It's Jesus Christ. And then also it said he stood where? On the Mount Zion. And notice there it's spelled with an S, but that is interchangeable. It can be spelled with a Z. Most people know it as Mount Zion with a Z, but that is the same place there. We know Mount Zion to be where? Jerusalem. Okay, that's you could say that's uh, God's headquarters, if I could say it that way, mm -hmm. of where he's going to uh, rule from. And Mount Zion is, is Jerusalem. And it says 144,000. Remember, we've talked about that number before. The 144,000, that is the redeemed Jews, the preachers and evangelists and missionaries of the Jewish people that are going to go out and preach the gospel uh, to the world. And there's going to be people saved because of that. But interesting thing about that, it said that they had their father's name written where? In their foreheads. Remember what we talked about, the difference there is, is the way you can tell the difference between God's people and, and, and Satan's people, or the Antichrist's followers. Remember that? God identifies his people with his father's head and their forehead. Satan, the Antichrist, they identify their people how? 666, six, 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 six. numerically, by numbers. And it's either in the forehead or the right hand. And it says no man is going to be able to buy or sell without that. And I believe that to be some sort of technology, some sort of a digital chip, which we're seeing in today's society. Yeah. We're seeing that technology now, but we see that the difference there and how they are known. And, uh, of course, like I said, they're known by the number of their God. Uh, being the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all that stuff we talked about in chapter number 13. But we see that in chapter number 14, and, and one of the identifications of the 144,000, one of the identifications of them, of, of what kind of people they are, is what? They're, they're virgins. We know that the Bible tells us that. It says, it says there in verse number 4 that they are virgins. And I love the latter part of the verse. It says, these are they which follow the Lamb, Jesus Christ, whithersoever he goeth. I like that phrase, whithersoever he goeth. Boy, wouldn't our Christian walk and our Christian life be so much better if we just went wherever he goes? If we went just wherever he says to go. You know, I like Isaiah when he says, send me. You know, a lot of times I've heard people say, send me, send me. Then he says, go. and be like, wait a minute, that's not where I'm in. You know, I mean, we've, we've seen stuff like that. We've experienced things like that. Be like, send me, Lord, I'm ready to go. He's like, okay, we'll do this. I just want to do that. You know, I, I, we, we see that. 
But that is a great testimony of a great Christian there that has faith in their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, following where, whithersoever he goeth. And it says, These were the redeemed from among men. Remember, that's just people on the earth at that time. God handpicked them mm -hmm. out of the men. And it says that they were what? The first fruits. The first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Meaning they were the first ones saved in this tribulation period. The 144,000, they were the first ones to be redeemed, the first ones to be saved. So they could go out and tell other people about Jesus Christ. So they could go out and witness to others and spread the gospel and preach the gospel and others be saved. It's a, it's a beautiful picture there of God's grace and his mercy. Because remember what amazes me so much about the book of Revelation is you see all the judgments happen mm -hmm. and all the horrible things happen and all the death happen. But in the midst of it all, God still shows mercy and grace. Mm -hmm. He still shows his love. And it's amazing. And we see um, in verse number six, John saying, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. And then we see all the different angels. He talks about a second angel, a third angel, and what all they did there. And remember verse number seven is actually the first place in the book of Revelation we find the word judgment. Remember we saw in verse number seven, it says, Sing with a loud voice, fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of the water. Again, we know that what all has transpired in the book of Revelation, we know it to be God's judgment on the world. We know it to be a time of Jacob's trouble. But figuratively speaking, this is the first time in the book of Revelation we see the actual word judgment, which is pretty amazing. That's the kind of a trivial thing there for you, but we see the word judgment called out here. And one of the huge points in verse number 8 is, is it says there followed another angel saying Babylon mm -hmm. is fallen, is fallen. You know, that's a huge encouragement to us mm -hmm. as Christians. Now remember where we're at in the book of Revelation here, chapters 12, 13, 14, they do not fall in chronological order of the entire book here. Chapters 12, 13, and 14 are kind of like a parenthesis in between the judgments. Okay, it is kind of giving us a precursor of what's to come. It's telling us what to expect later down the road. And I like early on in the book how God put that in there, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. He's telling us as believers, as Christians, hey, guess what? Evil doesn't win. Mm -hmm. The Antichrist isn't going to win. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Antichrist is going to set up a powerful kingdom. But he's going to only be as powerful as I let him be. We, we know that to be true. And remember when it says Babylon has fallen, that is not talking about a particular town. It's not talking about a particular country. It's not talking about a particular place. It's talking about the kingdom of the Antichrist. And we know that to be a one-world government, a one-world currency, and a one-world religion. We know all that stuff, those three things right there is what's going to be the main key, or the key points, if I could say it that way, of the Antichrist's kingdom. And he lets us in on a secret right here in verse number in chapter 14 saying Babylon is fallen. And it doesn't say that just once, it says that twice. Mm -hmm. It says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her what? Fornication. <clears throat> Notice what it said. All nations. Everybody. Listen, the Antichrist is going to come in and take the world by storm. And it, it talks about the crowns and the heads. And we know that how there are going to be many nations basically just hand over their power to this man. Mm -hmm. They're just going to hand over their country. They're going to hand over their riches. They're going to hand over everything about them and say, here, take our crown. It's going to be handed to him. He's going to be a political genius. He's going to be somebody that everybody's going to love. Everybody's going to follow. Everybody's going to listen to. And we know the false prophet to come in and basically make sure, hey, everybody's going to worship this guy. Mm -hmm. and I, you know, the false prophet's going to be a little helper, I guess you could say. And, and he's going to say, listen, worship this guy. And, you know, he's going to be kind of the, the czar over the one world religion and stuff. And, we're and we saw that back in chapter number 13. But the good thing here for us as Christians, we know that Babylon's not going to last. Mm -hmm. That kingdom will fall. And it tells us that there. And it said in verse number 12, we're getting uh, caught up here. It says, 
Here is the patience of the saints. Mm -hmm. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Remember, we talked about how many times throughout the book of Revelations, the saints, the martyrs, the Christians, they're constantly asking God, begging God, when are you going to have vengeance? When are, you, when are you going to claim the victory? When are you going to put this nonsense to rest? When, when are you going to fully overcome evil and do away with it? They're begging God. They're pleading with God. When are you going to, when are you going to go avenge me? Well, you know, I died for you, Lord. When are you going to avenge me? He's telling us here he's like, have patience. Be patient. It's coming. We've said many times in, in, the, in the theme of the Bible, other than the gospel itself, this judgment may be delayed, but judgment is coming. Mm -hmm. It is coming. And in God's perfect time, in his perfect will, he's going to put an end to all of it. Mm -hmm. Good will overcome evil, I promise. Mm -hmm. And we are victors. I'm thankful for that. I've read the last chapter. That's why, listen, guess what? The devil's read the last chapter too, and that's why he's so mad and ticked off. Because he knows at the end it don't work out too well for him. So he's trying to take everybody down that he can with him. Yes. And that's just like what a bad criminal does too. They try to take as many down with them as they can. And that's what he's doing in this world. Why is the world going crazy today? Because the devil's fighting tooth and nail knowing his time's about up. Like I've said before, we take it for granted a lot of times. And, and really uh, many people I've came in contact with don't even think of it. But listen, the devil knows the Bible. Yes. He knows what's going to happen. Listen, he's fighting tooth and nail today to try to take as many down with him as he can. He's trying to do everything that he can to go against God, go against God's word, go against God's people, to stop the spreading of the gospel. He's doing all that he can. But John pinned down here, he says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I like that. we got to have faith, don't we? It's impossible to please him without it. It's impossible to please him without it. we got to have faith. we got to keep looking to him. And we know that God's always in control. He's not lost. He's not lost control of this world. He's not lost. As crazy as it may seem, every time we turn the news on and everything going on and all the protesting and the looting and the rioting and the hurricanes hitting on the East Coast and the West Coast burning up, all this stuff that's happening, God's still not lost control. He's very much in control. Very much in control. And did you notice, I'll give you a side note, one thing I thought about this past week and stuff. I don't know if you've been keeping up with the fires in California, but I mean, it is just burning up. Mm -hmm. You realize that when those fires started, you realize when they started, if you look it up, they started the day the California government legislation passed the law to lessen, to lessen the offenses of people that sex minors. Pedophilia, they, they, are, they are guarding them, protecting them. And I thought, you know, there's not a chance that they're burning up. You let stuff like that in, God's going to judge you. And they're trying to lessen the effects of that. They're trying to protect those type of people to where if they do that, then the, then the judicial law, the criminal law and stuff, is not going to be as harsh on them. Or maybe they even get off scot free depending on the circumstances. There's a lot in that law, a lot in that bill. But that's a side note, but it's just, I find it ironic that all that stuff started the day that that stuff was passed out there. Listen, God's very much in control. He knows what's going on. He knows what's happening. Verse number 13 is where we're going to pick up tonight. That kind of gets you caught up just a little bit. And it says, And I heard a voice from heaven. I like how John pins that down. He said, I heard it. I heard the voice. And many times in the book of Revelation, we hear about hearing a voice from heaven. He says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. I read that verse and I think, you know what? We got a day coming where we're actually going to finally get some rest. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but in this day and time in which we live, uh, live, it's hard to find rest. What do I mean when I say rest? I'm talking about laying there with a clear mind, yes. 
not worrying about anything, yes. having peace that only God can give. Yes. Listen, in this day and time, it's hard to find that. <laughs> Why? Because there's always something going on. There's always something the devil makes you worry about. Yes. There's always a health issue. There's always a financial issue. There's always a family issue, a family problem. There's always something wrong in the neighborhood. There's always something going on that causes us to think, mm -hmm. causes us worry, causes us anxiety. Yes. We worry about things, but listen, it tells us there that they may rest from their labors. Listen, for the Christian, guess what? We have a day coming where we're going to be able to rest. Yes. We're gonna, not going to have to worry about things anymore. Kind of like the story, the illustration I gave this morning where, where he, the man, the missionary said it like God placed his hand on his shoulder and said, you're not home yet. Yeah. You know, that's true. We're not going to get that rest. We're not going to get all this stuff until what? We're home. Yes. This isn't our home. Yeah. We're just passing through. Yeah. But it says that they'll get their rest from their labors and their works do follow them. I'm thankful that God keeps track of what we do for him. That's going to be an exciting time. It's going to be an exciting day. I, I hope and pray that I'm able to take a prayer and just lay it at his feet. Yes. Because he's worthy. Oh, yes. Not me. I want to be able to have as much as I can get there and, and give it back to him, yes. lay back at his feet. That's what it's all about. Yes. But he says rest is coming. We get to verse number 14, and we see verses 14 through 20 here. This is, really the, this is really the Lord Jesus Christ's ultimate triumph over evil at the battle of Armageddon. We're going to see here a kind of a glimpse of what's to come. A glimpse of Armageddon. We're not to Armageddon yet. Okay, don't, don't think we're there yet. Remember, where we're at in chapter 14, we're still within that parentheses of what's happening between the judgments. We've not even made it to the seven bowls. Yeah, or the seven vials. Yeah, we've not made it there yet. That's coming. Next, uh, in chapter 16, we're getting there. But we see in verse number 14, and it says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. We see a few things right here in this verse. And, of course, remember... This is an overview of what's to come. We see there that John describes a white cloud. Anytime the book of Revelation refers to clouds or a white cloud like that, it's referring to majesty. It's talking about the Lord's majesty. That's what it's referring to. And then we go on down and it says, having on his head a what? A golden crown. A golden crown. The victor's crown a laurel wreath worn by those who celebrated victory in war or an athletic competition. We've seen it before. You see on trophies a lot of times uh, a laurel wreath placed on the head like a crown. That's what that's kind of referring to here and talking about that same concept. But Christ is uh, now wears the particular crown. And in this case, it's made of gold as a conqueror coming out of heaven to prevail over his enemies. Listen, there's going to be a day he's going to come down. Everybody's going to know who he is. Oh, yes. Amen. And listen, uh, really and truly, the world doesn't understand this, but they'll understand it one day. Mm -hmm. Right now, we have a choice to either serve God or not. We have a choice today to recognize God for who he is. Amen. Listen, there's going to be coming a day you're not going to have a choice. Yes. You're going to realize who he is. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get down and bow. It says every tongue's going to confess, every knee's going to bow. Everybody's going to know who he is. Everybody's going to bow before him one day. Think about that for a minute. Every person that's lived, every person that's going to live, everybody, every every knee's going to bow and tongue's going to confess. It's going to happen. People may not believe that. People may not realize that. But listen, it's going to happen. The Bible says so. Yes. It's going to happen. It's coming. And then it says, after the golden crown there, it talks about a sickle. It says, and in his hand, a sharp sickle. A sharp sickle. That's important. Why? Because that sickle represents swift and devastating judgment. That's what that is referring to here, swift and devastating judgment. It's a harvesting tool. 
you worked on the farm and stuff, you, you know what a sickle is and how you could break through it and how it can uh, tear things down and, and quickly do that. And it's very, very sharp. It's a harvesting tool. It's a farming instrument. We see that here. We see that it's going to represent swift and devastating judgment. Mm. On what? On the world. Mm -hmm. On the world. Yes. It says, in another angel, notice that, another angel. Remember in the previous chapter, we heard of all those different angels. It just blows my mind how many angels were seen in the book of Revelation. It's like, the Lord have mercy. Could you imagine that picture? Mm -hmm. What's going to be like? But it says, in another angel mm -hmm. came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is what? Right, right. It is ripe. Or in other words, it's dried. It's ripe. It's ready to be harvest. We see it talking about another angel here, and we see the agricultural uh, uh, terminology here and of course the Jewish people would understand this and, and farmers and things like that but we see that the word ripe is, is put in this verse and that word ripe there it means that they're ripe or they're ready for judgment God's judgment is coming now we know already based on the book of Revelation made it to the chapter 14 here and we've already seen what the seven trumpets we, we, we've seen those seven seals. Mm -hmm. We saw the devastation and the destruction. We, we saw the four horsemen come and the things that happened and, and no doubt the millions and millions, if not billions of people that died just through that. Yes. But listen, what's about to come and what's about to happen is going to be worse than all of that. Yeah. And it's hard for us to <laughs> imagine that and think that, but you've got to remember 21 categories uh, catalytic just judgments here happening seven seven and seven as they progress they get what worse and worse and worse and not only do they get worse and worse and worse they get closer together and closer together and closer together remember what god said he's like listen we're not going to tell time with it anymore basically it's just going to happen one right after the other there's going to be no space no time gap in between they're going to happen quickly going to happen quickly. Remember, it's going to have to happen quickly. We're in the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. Remember, the tri tribulation lasts for, what, seven years. Mm -hmm. The first three and a half, don't really have to worry too much about it. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's setting the stage for things to come and all that stuff and the Antichrist and all that thing that's going on, but the last three and a half years mm -hmm. is when this thing's really going to take off. When it's really uh, going to start rocking and rolling through here. And we see all these judgments happen. And they're happening quickly. One right after the other. But the angel said there, the harvest of the earth is ripe. It's dried. It's ready. It's ready to be judged. And it says, and he, and he that sat on the cloud thrust his sickle on the earth. And the earth was reaped. He sent judgment down to the earth. And notice it says earth. That's the whole world. That's the whole world. Yes. Listen, a lot of people, you know, I, I mean, I'm as patriotic as they come. I love America and, and patriotism. I, I love everything about our history and things. I love that. Yes. But listen, you study this out and stuff, America's not mentioned in, in the end. Say what happens. I don't know. I don't know what all happened. But you know, we, we, we are proud of that flag and we... We uphold that flag, but at the end of the day, it's going to burn just like the nation of Iraq mm -hmm. or the nation of Iran yes. or the nation of China. Mm -hmm. It's going to, listen, what's going to happen at the very end is all eyes are going to be focused on him. Mm -hmm. It's all going to come together and it's all going to be about him. Mm -hmm. This is judgment on the world, on the earth. Now, we know the Bible talks about a time of Jacob's trouble. Yes. And we know that, 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 uh, Jerusalem, Israel stuff is going to be judged. But listen, it's going to be for the whole world. People are going to know uh, that they're going to know who God is. Yes. They're going to recognize where this judgment is coming from. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have many people, like I said before, many people that are going to be mad at God mm -hmm. because of the judgment that's coming. Mm -hmm. You're going to have people that are cursing God mm -hmm. because of the judgment that you're going through. 
<clears throat> all of that stuff is going to happen. Yeah. It's going to happen. It says that the earth was reaped. Notice verse number 17. And another angel, or here we see another angel, came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having what? A sharp, a sharp sickle. So we see another one having a sharp sickle. And then we go right in verse number 18 and notice what it says, and another angel mm -hmm. came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. Now here we uh, see it talking just in verse number 15 about the earth is ripe. As we read further into this, we're seeing more agricultural terminology used in it talking about the grapes and it talking about the vines. And we know that he's the true vine. Yes. We know that from his teachings yes. in Matthew that I'm thankful for that. He's the true vine. Yes. But it's, it, it's talking about the vines and, and the grapes here. And notice what it says. It says that her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel, verse number 19, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now, first of all, that one phrase at the very end of that verse should bother us. The wrath of God. That's something you don't want to be involved in. Amen. That's something you don't want to be a recipient Amen. of. That's something that I shouldn't get joy out of preaching. Because, listen, I don't want people to endure that. I don't want to see people go through that. I don't want to see people die and go to hell. Amen. But here we see that it says, cast it into the what? Great wine press. Now notice this verse number 20. We're going to see that terminology used again. It said, And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Now I'm just going to be honest with you. This is a very graphic and gruesome picture. What's that saying? Well, when you got when they would make the make the wine, the wine press and stuff, they would put the grapes in there and they would put great pressure under it. And it would actually cause the juice, the grape juice, to flow out. Mm -hmm. What this is saying in these verses and stuff is the judgment of God is going to be so swift, so devastating, so destructive, that it's going to be like people are dying by the by the thousands, by the millions, and you're going to basically just have blood flowing like out of the juice out of a wine press. Think about that for a minute. God's judgment on this world. This is the wrath of God. It is a great wine <coughs> press. It's as if you took all these people and put them in that wine press and all you had flowing out would be blood. I know that's gory. I know that's graphic, but that's the Bible. Yeah. This is something that's going to happen. It's going to come about. It said that the wine press was trodden without the city and blood came out of the wine press, meaning it just flowed out of it like juice. And it said, even unto the horse's bridles. Now, I don't know a whole lot about horseback riding, but I did study some of this out and stuff, and you're talking about four to four and a half feet. Yeah. Four to four and a half uh, feet thick, deep. And it said, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. The wine press. Like I said, it's a vivid imagery. It's, it's gruesome imagery here, but it's true. It's truth. John pinned this down as he was given this by God. It's vivid imagery signifies a horrendous slaughter or a bloodbath. It carries the idea of the slaughter of all the enemies of God who are still alive at this time. Mm -hmm. Whoever's alive at this point in time, and that's an enemy of God, will be killed. It's talking about their blood. And it would be so much blood that there again, four to four and a half feet deep. And it says that it's a space of a thousand 
and 600 furlongs. When you study that out, you're talking about 180 miles. 180 miles. Think of the distance. 180 miles long, four to four and a half feet deep. The wrath of God. But listen, he has every right to do that. Some people say, well, I don't want to serve a God that does something like that. Listen, he has every right to do it. He has every right to do it. We talked about that grace this morning. By grace we're saved. I'm thankful for that grace and that mercy. Listen, people have a chance today to make things right. Listen, if we're alive and well today, God's showing us his grace and his mercy. And he's giving people a chance to make things right with him. He's giving them a chance saying, you don't have to go through this mess. We're talking about here the battle of Armageddon, and it's yet to happen. It's not happened yet. It is going to happen later on in the book of Revelation, and we're going to talk a whole lot more about that. And we're actually going to talk a lot in detail about the battlefield over there, and, and many scholars believe they know exactly where that's going to take place, the, the valley of Medigeo over there. And, and, it's, and even Napoleon himself, the great warrior, stood over that valley one day, and he said, of all the battlefields in the world, that is the most beautiful and strategic battlefield he's ever seen. That's where the battle of Armageddon is going to take place. And do you realize that that battle, the way it's going to be won, the way it's going to be over like that, is simply God speaking. A lot of people think that it's going to be a drawn out battle. Fighting back and forth like we've, like we've witnessed and seen through our history and even seen today with with terrorists in different uh, countries and things. Listen, it's not it's not going to be that. Yeah. It's going to be God just speaking the word. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. Swift and devastating mm -hmm. judgment is going to happen. Four to four and a half feet deep. 180 miles wide. And when you study that amount of furlong there, when you study that out, that is the length of the battlefield that they have measured over there today in the Middle East where the Battle of Armageddon will take place. Think about that for a minute. I don't know if you've ever Googled that image or YouTubed that area over there. So I encourage you to do that. It's, it's an amazing study. It's an amazing thing to see. I mean, the battlefield, I mean, it, it is just a huge, beautiful piece of property. I mean, just, I mean, it's breathtaking. I've never seen it physically. I've never been there in person. I do know some people that have. I encourage you to, to look that up and see that. And that will help you, too, as we get further into this study. And when we actually start talking about the Battle of Armageddon and getting into much further detail about that, we'll talk more about that battlefield and and, and the significance of that and what it's like over there today. There's a lot of uh, significance about all of that. But we see that God here has really given us an overview of the battle of Armageddon at the latter part of this chapter. He's like, this is what's to come. Mm -hmm. It's not here yet. It's not happening yet. But here's your little precursor. Here's your, uh, just a little sneak peek of what's to come. He told John to pin it down for us. It's coming later on in the book. I promise. We'll get there eventually. I don't know when, but we'll get there eventually. But we're going to study about that and read about that and see that. But we see the sharp sickle here. God's judgment on the earth. Chapter number 15, verse number 1. We'll be finished for tonight. Look at this. We'll start here. We'll do chapter 15 next week in great detail. But look at chapter 15, verse number 1. This chapter describes the preparation for the pouring out of the seven vials or the seven bowls. Don't you understand those are the same thing? Some people say seven vials. Some people say seven bowls. So it's interchangeable. Same thing. But this chapter describes the preparation for the pouring out of the seven vials or the seven bowls, which will constitute the final expression of the wrath of God during the tribulation. We see verse number one of chapter 15. It says, and I saw another sign in heaven. Remember, John talks about all these signs and wonders and things that he sees. We've seen that terminology before from him. He says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, 
seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up, what's that last phrase? The wrath of God. Remember chapters 12, 13, and 14 is a parenthesis inserted in there for us to get an overview of what's to come. We will revisit a lot of that stuff again and talk more about it in greater detail, but I believe it's God's way of showing us, hey, here's what's to come, but don't worry, Christian. Here's what's to come, but don't worry. We're going to win this thing. Here's what's to come, but Babylon's going to fall. But So now we're in chapter 15. We're out of those parentheses now. We're getting back. Remember, we saw the seven seals. We saw the seven trumpets. Now we're getting to the seven bowls or the seven plagues. But notice a few things about it. It says great and marvelous. He uses that terminology. He said seven angels having the seven. He doesn't say the seven plagues, does he? He says seven last plagues. In other words, he's saying, all right, this is it. Remember, grand total, 21 judgments. They come to seven. Seven, seven. We know the number seven to be God's number of completeness. Yes. We know that from our numerical study we did a few months ago. And nu numeric numbers and, and uh, that type uh, of thing in the Bible is very important. And, and we could go a lot of different directions with that. But we see seven angels having the seven last plagues. John's saying, I'm putting that in there. This is it. The last plagues. But then he goes on to write, he says, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. That matches up with the terminology we read there in verse number 19 of chapter 14 when he said at the end, uh, cast him to the great wine press of the what? wrath of God. We see how all this kind of interconnects with one another. How all this comes together. Mm -hmm. We see these, these, these judgments. We see this wrath of God. He said that these Plagues, these seven last plagues is getting ready to be poured out on earth, on planet earth, on the world. He said, in them, they're filled up with the wrath of God. And listen, for an unbeliever, that should scare us to death. Yeah. Yeah. That the, should scare them to death. That's the whole world. I mean, it's, Absolutely, it's the, the entire world. world. That's not a nation, that's the whole world. That's exactly right. It's the entire world. It's not just one nation, it's not just one country. This is God's judgment on the world. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, I believe we lose sight of that. Yes. I think we think, well, this is going to happen over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or this is going to happen in that country or to these people. But listen, during this point in time, nobody's going to escape. Yeah. These judgments are going to happen to the world. Yes. And we see that in verse number 15, uh, chapter 15, verse number 1 there, mm -hmm. telling us these angels are ready. They got their vials, they got their plagues, are filled up and ready to go. We'll stop there tonight and pick back up next week in Revelation chapter 15. I wanted to just do uh, verse number one to kind of give you an idea of what's to come. Now, chapter 15 is a very short chapter, only eight verses in it, but we can see just a few verses could be a whole lot of detail in the book of Revelation. And uh, so next Sunday night, Lord willing, we will finish chapter number 15 of the book of Revelation. And then after that, we will get into chapter number 16, which will be the seven vials of the wrath of God. We will get to those final seven vials in chapter number 16. So remember, when we studied that, chapters 12, 13, 14, we've been in that study for, I guess, five weeks now, these three chapters. When you're in that, you're in a parenthesis. Don't think that all that happens in that chronological order because when we get later on in the book of Revelation, it will confuse you if you believe that way. You say, well, we've already talked about that. Well, yeah, we did. It was because God gave us an overview of what's to come. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but we finished chapter 14 tonight. Thank the Lord for that. I, I hope maybe you got something out of it. Hopefully you learned something there. I know I've learned a ton through this study. And listen, I don't claim to know much at all, I promise you. And I'm learning with you as we go. Um, but verse number fifth, or verse number one of chapter 15 is, is a very, I think, humbling verse there uh, with the way John describes that and what's about to happen. You know it's about to get bad. You know things are about to really turn loose now. I mean, it's been bad before, but it's going to get worse. 
And uh, we'll finish chapter number 15 next week, Lord willing. I hope you're able to be with us. It's so good to see you here tonight. And thank you for going to here with us, visiting and